Well, it's the end of round 17, six weeks to go before the finals kick off and the lid is finally off at Tigerland. Yes, it's official and we're all excited. Nick Rewald, our special guest tonight. Plenty to talk to Nick about, but Rosie, I'm excited not just about your shirt tonight, but uh, about the fact that the Tigers are going to be there for the first time in just on 12 years. And Mike's going to give a massive rap shortly. But there's some other big games <laughs> on the weekend. Uh, Hawthorne Essendon 1v2. Sydney will test the Tigers, Mike, I believe. A couple of others, Frio Crows, big game. And Port Adelaide, Brisbane's probably not the game we thought it was going to be. Uh, start of the year, you would have said that one, a bit of a snooze fest. But now it's a huge game, isn't it? What about it? Gold Coast and Carlton, is he? Yeah, lots of, lots of good footy on the weekend coming up, absolutely. Well, 1v2, Mike. It's, uh, said, I know you're not that excited about the Tigers, and I'm going to find out why just shortly, because right there it says they are six with 11 wins, five losses, and a position that could well go up rather than down. The older you get, Jared, the longer it takes you to get aroused. Yeah, well, there's, uh, you can get treatment for that, Michael. I'm not sure what you're saying there. But... Look, there's still a large slice of old Richmond about New Richmond. We'll talk about that later. But I saw them yesterday. Uh, they'll want to play better than that uh, come September. What about you, Ruzi? Are you excited about the Tigers? Can they do any damage? Well, I thought, uh, yes. I, what I do like about them now is they're starting to tackle. And I, I think that was the, the missing link for them in the first sort of five to ten weeks. I thought their, their, their control of the stoppages... I mean, you would have loved Cochin's goal, Michael. Yeah, I did. That was, that was a massive moment in this game. Yeah. It's three-quarter time. They're under pressure. He gets a dodgy free kick, I must say. Um, we'll see it here. He goes, gets the ball, throws his head back, which is unlike him. Gets the free kick, siren goes. Yeah. The skipper's got to kick it, and he's a short kick, Cochie, isn't he? Gets a lot of it, but he kicks yeah, he short. Does. Uh, and he measured it, and he landed it. And you, every bloke in black and yellow went to him after that. I think it was a really significant moment yeah. in their season. Oh, I thought their stoppage numbers were really good. I mean, they dominated, and that came out of a clearance. So there was a poor effort there. But if you looked at this, 11 to 8 centre clearances, total clearances 40-23, hit our advantage. But scores from stoppages, uh, Jared, were massive. I mean, 5-6 yeah. to 0-3. And, and, and Ross Lyon coach teams are normally very, very good around the clearances, around. They're very, very well organised. And I thought that was a, a really big difference in the game, was the fact that the Tigers did really well in that area. Let me give you an example, Rosie, of the new Richmond. We saw this yesterday, and it finished with a Dustin Martin goal. <clears throat> and when they play this sort of footy, it's irresistible. I mean, they just attacked the footy, they went forward, it didn't go sideways, it was just using... There were blokes there to help the guy out under pressure, yep. runners everywhere, and finally it comes into Dustin Martin and he balances up and kicks the goal. Now, that was the highlight yeah. of the afternoon for me. He could have kicked uh, three in the first yeah, quarter. Yeah, he could have. The fell on the left there, Matty White. I mean, he's crucial to them. I think that what you're alluding to, Mike, is rather than that side to side, I think Matty White that gives them that, straightens them up, runs and carries. And, you know, they have got some speed on the outside and, now. And they didn't use it. Earlier in the game, it was the sideways kick, yeah. the short kick. Now, playing, I reckon that would play into Frio's hands. If you try to play that possession game, they'll break it down. They just miss way too many targets, including Cochin. And, and, and the fumble there from Hooley. But... This, they're the ones that kill you against good teams, aren't they? Well, I guess what you're saying was, and I watched this game really closely like you do, I mean, it was a scrappy affair, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't a game... I mean, three, Freeman maybe had an excuse, had three or four of their best players out, but even, I think, Ross Lyon, their coach, said after the game they slaughtered the football. But I think your point is right. I mean, against... certainly wasn't two teams at the top of their game. Having no. said that... I mean, Richmond probably in the past lose that game and, and go down. And I think that's the biggest thing I, I see about the Tigers now. They're winning, you know, in a, in a less... Yeah, aesthetically, I know you love aesthetics of the game, Michael, but I think when you can win those games, mm. you're actually moving forward as a footy club. Rusi, the bottom line is Freo had five of their starting, best starting 22 out, and they're eight points down, playing yeah. ordinary footy 10 minutes into the last quarter. Now, the Tigers will get better. Oh, I thought Damien Hardwick's response was perfect. He was conservative. Mm. I mean, I think he wanted the public to not see that they were getting too excited. But he said there's still a lot of areas that they've got to work on, and they do. Yeah, no. Oh, I still am not convinced by what I've seen from Richmond this year that they can hold their own in September. But all they've got to do is keep on improving, don't they? And they've still got some young kids in there that are going to have natural improvement. Yeah. They're up against the side Alice that Alice is a beauty, Floster. Yeah, yeah they have got Up those. against the side that make you play scrappy football. That's OK, but Rewalt is, is a 5 out of 10 year. Yeah. Marriage mm. is not as, what he good, not as good as what he was last year. And although Cochin's numbers are really good, he's not having impact. 
That goal he kicked before mm. that we showed, that's his fourth goal for the year. Yeah, yeah. But having said that, I mean, they're winning games, and I guess that's my mm. point before. I think the Richmond in the past, and you know, they haven't played in the final since what, 2001, we said. So Richmond of the past few years probably aren't winning those games. I like the fact that they're winning, they've still got some room for improvement, and they're, and they're playing good football within games, but probably still haven't yeah, reach the heights of perhaps... What so you, you think they'll... How, will they I'll tell you what, Sydney? Mike, you're going to get a better gauge, another gauge, if next you like, Sunday. next Sunday. Mm. SCG, yep. can't wait for that game. Yep. It's up against the best midfield in the competition right now, and they were uh, in dominant form collectively uh, and individually on the weekend. You saw them first-hand. I mean, the four Swans midfielders could be the All-Australian. They won't be, but they could be, couldn't they? None of those folks... Jack Hannabury, Kennedy, McVeigh, they could all they all justify yeah. an all Australian jumper. This oh, year. absolutely. I mean I think like you're saying, uh, Jared, I think they're the hardest working midfield yep. in the competition. I mean there's some great vision of, of Hannabury and look he's a, an elite runner, but the fact that he runs so hard there's, there's one thing being an elite runner in the training track and yep. and running, you know, three minute runs and five minute mm. runs and we'll talk to Nick Rewald who's a great runner, he's a great game runner. But Dan Hannabury's now a, a great game runner. He is, and his uh, work rate is, uh, I think, uh, being only surpassed in his own words by Kieran Jack. The, the most amazing thing I saw in that game was the words that came out of Dan yep. Hannabury's mouth after the match. He was asked who was the number one midfielder uh, at the Sydney Swans, and uh, this is his response. So who's the best midfielder in this team? It's got to be you right now, doesn't it? Oh, mate, there's no doubt, I'm telling you, there's no doubt Kieran Jack's <laughs> the, the best going around, mate. He's the hardest 2A runner. I reckon in the comp, mate. So, uh, you know, he's one of the guys that leads from the front and everyone tries to go follow his lead. It's a massive rap for Kieran it Jack. Is. And uh, every time I watch him, I just think to myself, what a fantastic story for footy. And uh, the two-way running aspect, I don't think a lot of fans go to the game to watch a bloke run from the back yeah. forward pocket to the back pocket. Mm. But that is what is uh, so heralded at Sydney. You see it with Mumford, you see it with all their midfielders, and that's why they're so tough to beat. Andrew Gaff was on Kieran Jack at one stage, and Gaff is a pretty uh, aerobic beast, a hard worker, mm. but he got blown off the park and a good lesson for him. But just take a look if you want to see work rate. This is Dan Hannabury at his absolute best. He gets a couple of possessions down in the half-back flank of a pretty long ground at uh, Subiaco. And he gets on his bike. He can sniff an opportunity here. Jesse White, another great improver. He gets the ball through to another member, Luke Parker. He goes off screen. Kieran Jack comes on board. But you'll just see who bobs up with the ball. I think that's the other thing is, Jared. they're not running forward until they win it, Mike. I mean, mm. they're running forward once they get it. That's mm. the difference between the Sydney midfields. Look at that work rate. So that's 140 metres he's running. Yeah, but they're always in control of that football. So he's not cheating Dan Hannabury. Kieran Jack's not cheating. We see him running through. They're just running hard for their teammates. They're running hard to control. You've got, I think it's Craig Bird comes in the screen there. They all support each other. And then and, uh, Bob's uh, Dan Hannabury. Now, tell me this, Ruth. Is there a kid called Dane Rampey playing in this team? Yep. I hear, I, I don't know this firsthand, but that he had two pre-seasons with the Western Bulldogs. Yeah, John, I confirmed that yesterday. He confirmed yeah, that, did he? that's right. And he's been ignored. Now, you can't ignore a kid with that ability. He's, he's in the playing in the best team, in, or one of the two best teams in the competition, and, and yep. not looking out of place. How does he not get a run at a team that's down near the bottom of the ladder. Yeah, look, it's surprising. I mean, the boys, Newington boy, played a lot of basketball as a, as a kid growing up. Didn't play a heap of footy. Went down to Melbourne to try his luck. Worked really, really hard. Came back up. Played for the University of New South Wales in the Premier League last year. Uh, I remember seeing him played for the Swan Seconds against the Giants last year out at Skoda Stadium. And you could tell that this kid could play AFL football. He just he has all the things that you see now. He's an elite runner. He runs about a 10-minute 3K. He's got good speed. He's What's got the good knock courage. On well, I think the knock on him, and I'd have to do some research, I think the knock on him was maybe his kicking wasn't was It's improved super. a lot, then. It's improved a lot. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's slotted really. And it, it's going to be hard. The Swans have got a lot of injuries. But he looks to be yeah. one that will probably hold his place in, in the best 22. And that's the big issue right now. Well, we're all talking about uh, potential flag favourites. Hawthorne maintains it with the bookmakers. But the Sydney Swans, they are, in the absence of these stars, getting some games into players that are giving they them are. a Geelong-like list. I mean, the, the depth of Geelong's list is formidable. But the Sydney Swans also uh, is getting bigger. And they've got another bloke, Jesse White, who has uh, come through the system. I thought he was just about gone. We mentioned him last year on the couch, but... He is at the penny's drop with Jesse, yep. and he's now 
uh, has got a work rate to match his ability. Look, he's got he's got super talent, Jesse. There's never been the size in of him, Michael. Mm. His mm. Size, but you're right. And it seems that the, what what's happening at the moment, the, the senior players are dragging some of these young players up, Mike. And that's that's the standards that's set. You look at this, and the great thing about the finish here, Jared, it's not a dribble kick along the ground. <laughs> it he goes there. for the standard drop yep. punt over the umpire's hat, Michael. And you got to love that. And we'll took a look at a couple of goals later on by a few Geelong boys. Is he six six? He'd be 6'5", 6'6", six, six, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, and he's a, he can jump, he's got good speed, not super endurance, but he's got good speed and, and he's now playing around his potential. And Jed Lamb also yep. uh, a pretty impressive display. One final word on the West Coast Eagles who are struggling at the present time, we all know, is the form of Eric McKenzie. Before we move on, I think Eric McKenzie just needs some recognition for his fantastic year. Their defence has been quite yep. superb. Darren Glass... And Eric McKenzie, who has taken all the big guns this year, has got to be a significant nomination in the All-Australian squad and a genuine contender for the key spot. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. The other bloke I've loved this year, though, is Darren Glass. Yep. The more yep. I see him play them, I think he is a, he is a giant, Darren Glass. And there was certainly a lot of pressure on their defence on the weekend. Their midfield got absolutely slaughtered. Um, very few inside 50s, particularly for the first three quarters. So their defence held up reasonably well, given the, the delivery and the, the dominance of Sydney's midfield. Bombers beat Hawthorne Friday night, Rizzy. Mm -hmm. Bombers are going to be on top of the ladder. Uh, I perhaps should address this to you, Jared. Mm -hmm. The plot thickens, doesn't it? I mean, we, we're two weeks away, maybe, from a result in the Asada inquiry. Mm -hmm. And Essendon could be sitting on top of the ladder when that conclusion comes. That's right. There's a, there was a commission meeting only a couple of days ago. There was some uh, relevant information came from Jared Waitley on 360, which has muddied the waters fairly significantly with AOD. Have you I changed... didn't need any more mud, Jared. No. Have you changed your mind? Uh, I think they're going to lose points. Right. Changed my mind from what? Well, I think last week you thought that the, the comments from Andrew I thought Demetrio... Andrew Demetrio was, was conditioning us to a soft landing, but... Um, I've had my mind changed, if I can put it that way. OK. Those who should know yeah. suggest that it was the wrong conclusion to draw. Well, based on the fact that it looks like it's, there's growing evidence to suggest, as we thought, that uh, those at Essendon who were OKing AOD have been given bum information, w w where is it going to stack up uh, if that's excluded? We've got the other drugs that we spoke mm. about. Is it going to be based on the legal elements or is it going to be based oh. on the control well, elements? Who knows? All I know is that it, two people who are highly reputable on this subject are Patrick Smith and Caroline Wilson and they both see dire consequences for the bombers. Mm. And they both get good mail. There's no question about that. If so in I fact think the Commission came down and said, OK, all points are off, Yep. are the bombers going to take them to court? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I suspect there are... Uh, knee-jerk response would be to do that. Mm. But if it's played out in the courts, no one's going to win no, out of that, are they? No, not at all. No. Well, no one's won so far, but no. uh, as you said, the Bombers could be on top of the ladder, and uh, that's the great loss for me. It's just, there's this excitement around the Bombers at the present time, mm. but the whole thing has been overshadowed by a very dark I don't know why this, this uh, people saying, oh, good, let's get their penalty over with this year, because they'll be better next year. Mm. But <laughs> you can't pitch that, that far for them, and they are right in the mix this year, aren't oh, they? Oh, absolutely. I mean, their best is, is exceptional. I mean, they were a bit scrubby on the weekend, but taking a little bit away from the Giants, I thought they were a lot better. You know, they've improved a bit, the Giants, and they want to after the Swans' effort. But certainly their best estimate is very very good and ask both of you i mean the, the points are the critical issue yeah. now. money that can be found draft yeah. choices that's too far away you think they'll lose points on what you two know at the moment do you suspect that Eston will be take have their points taken off them i've here heard two or three different stories gut feel jared gut feeling is i think the commission are going to if they can get a result with Essendon without going through the courts i think they will but if Essendon are going to crank it up i'm not sure where it's going but to. but they've finish. got to impose the penalty first mm. so do you think it'll be points I don't know, Mike. I don't think you can. I don't Is think he? anybody can actually no, no, sit here and say. I didn't so. profess to know. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting. Living in Sydney, you, you, you can distance yourself, and, and when I come down here, you, you turn on the radio, and you've got sort of five or six days away from it. I said, I, my feeling is more, Mike, and, not, and maybe I'm wrong. My feeling is that the football public seems to be demanding that. Seems mm. to be. I don't know whether that's mm. a fair statement or not, but that's yeah. what I get the feeling when I arrive back here Monday lunchtime to talk about Essendon. Is something has to happen. So that's, that's my only gut feel comes from, from the feeling I get when I arrive in Melbourne and then I go back to Sydney and we sort of don't talk about it, obviously, for, for the next five or six days. So 
That's the feeling that I do get within the football I think community. the phrase is right, something has to happen. I think that encapsulates my view. Mm. Well, Essendon are saying that, that they're guilty of, uh, with the Switzkowski report of, of uh, corporate issues which yeah. have, have uh, put players at risk health-wise, etc. So there's going to be some issues, but whether or not it goes to points, Mike, I think is going to be a uh, major battle. <laughs> go on. Mm. <laughs> Well, let's go on about uh, the really exciting events of the weekend, and that was the historic win for the Suns in, on the Gold Coast in front of 20-plus uh, thousand people against a uh, pretty high, highly touted side, Rusey. Yeah, look, big win. Really good effort from the, the Suns. Great game. Watch the game intently. It was good. Um, you can just see the talent rising. We see Jaeger Amir, you know, he's got to be close to the rising star. He's, he's had a super, just a super talented... Yeah, just their ability. They've got some game changers, What's, Mike. Yeah. Rizzi, number three. And Jared we haven't always Brennan. seen that. I mean, the thing that yep. was missing in his game, he, he could always yep. play the game, but his ability, to, his willingness to work hasn't been yep. there. Harbrow. I love the way they played. Yeah, no, I thought there was a lot to like about it. They just, they just got a number, a number of game changers, and they're really quite a spectacular team. But I think the thing, Jared, that surprised me, I don't think Gary Ablett has had that much... <laughs> Freedom right. since I spoke to his Oz kick coach today. <laughs> and if you look here, you just look at the mentality of, and we've spoken a little bit about it. It's Ablett versus Beams and Prestia Ball. I mean, again, Collingwood are more that hunt ball, see ball, get ball. And there's Ball, speaking of it. So he's got Prestia. There's uh, Gary. He was on, he's on Swan. So there's there. Swan. Yeah. Swan Ablett, yeah. he just lets him go. And Prestia's down the bottom of the screen. Ball lets him go. And there it is. Quick flick out, another handball. I mean, there's one... Th Look, Gary Ablett's an outstanding player, and if you're going to give him so much room, these Ablett beams after half-time. This is supposed to be a tagging role. But the problem's not just beams. It's got to be a collective. Look at all that space coming through. through. There. Yeah. There's no-one there on the outlet. He dodges around Maxwell, not even there, and he kicks a goal. I, I mean, I know Nathan talked we tried, but you've got to get someone... You've got so to get McCaffrey's someone McCaffrey's their only negative yeah. player, right? Now, is he geared to, to, uh, to go with, with Ablett? Well... Don't get me wrong, you can, you can tag Gary Ablett and still get beaten, but you can't not tag him, or you can't not run with him. But didn't they have... P Pendlebury was side-by-side side with him at, uh, in the first half at centre bounces. Yeah, they're, they're offensive midfielders. And then, Swanee, midfield, and then Beams, centre bounces Beams, is irrelevant. Centre, yeah, I mean, and then Beams ran with him. Yeah, the starting points are irrelevant, and, and we saw that with the Collingwood of midfielders. Their starting points to go and get the football. You can't have someone like that playing on Gary Ablett. He still might get you 40. We know mm. what a great player he is. But if you're going to let him run around, he's had 27 up to half time. 17 reckon... in the second, 17 <laughs> in the second quarter. I reckon Nathan Jones, another bald man in the midfield, is entitled to protest. He's getting hard tagged yeah. up on Darwin at the same time that Gary Ablett's getting a free run and 49 possessions. And you can't take the view, can you, that, that this place untagged? No, you can't. No. I mean, it's, it's farcical to say that because you, you've at least got to make him... You, you can't give Gary a silver silver service. You mm. know he gets twenty. I said twenty seven in the first half. It's just fraught with danger. Okay, let's talk about Tom Nichols, Mike. Rizzy, your shirt is still. <laughs> say. Tom Nichols, he is uh, a talent. I'm not sure mm. what Blue is going to do with his ruck stocks, but all of a sudden well, they got Zach Smith and Charlie Dixon. To Charlie come Dixon back in. probably yeah. goes becomes the nominal forward. They got Bock coming back into this side, but. There's no way known, based on what we see with this kid, he can be out of this side. He's everything yeah, you want in yeah, a mobile run. Yeah, look, and he hits the ball. Nice one out there to, to Gary. Look, he, he's follow-up. He's hungry. There's another nice little tap down to press here. He, he was certainly impressive, Mike. I mean, mm. they've, got, they've got some talent up there that they can, as you said, they, they might be able to move a couple along to get maybe a, a few more experienced players in the in the club as well. well Ten kegs mightn't be bad. <laughs> it would it help. help. Frame, wouldn't it? Travis yeah. Cloak is an issue, though. Bucks yeah. didn't let him off the hook. Gave him no alibi. Cost him, and it has cost mm. him at yeah. various stages. But uh, if you have a look at his heat map, it's pretty clear that uh, when he's in front, right in front, he uh, gets the job done, and occasionally when he's out on the wings, the, the blue markers are the goals, but it's yeah. those red markers. You can see that those conditioned wide leads are uh, getting him to take marks in fairly low efficient areas. I'm yeah. surprised he's that efficient in front of goal, I yeah, must no, say. Yeah. Oh, I reckon recently, I think he's gone four for 18 the last... Well, there it, four, I think four goals, 14, his last 18 mm. shots at goal. So. How frustrating is it for the blokes up the ground? Look, it is a big factor. I know Nathan talked about it after the game, and you can talk about Gary Abba getting 49, but kicking, kicking straight is a massive, mm. massive sign of, of whether you win or lose. And I when think I, it, it does become frustrating for other players. When I asked you, last week we read that Collingwood had gone to City Hall and complained about the treatment yep. of Travis Cloak in marking contests. He got two, maybe three of the softest free kicks of the round at the weekend. Mm. Your experience, well, let's have a look at a yep. couple of them here. Just goes now, to that's show that a genuine it wasn't a waste spoil, of time. Isn't it? Well, but I remember Rusey saying it was a waste of time to go to uh, the AFL. This one's extraordinary. 
That one, yeah. The, the guy's coming back, turns turns around. Here he is, looks at the ball. Cloak's actually pushing him off. He didn't do anything. So is that, do you think that's a reaction to last week's publicity? Oh, it, it has to be. Because but that, but you, you used to yeah. say you'd go and talk to them at the AFL yeah. on, about Barry Hall. And it didn't help one Yeah, most of the time you just go because you're a bit frustrated and you just wanted to vent your frustration. You didn't really expect there was going to be any sort of change. Yeah, having said that, most of the time I spoke to Jeff, he was good, and you look, we missed that one, or, you know, we, that, that should have been a free kick, that shouldn't have been a free kick. So there wasn't, I mean, there wasn't any sort of animosity, but generally you'd, you, you wouldn't expect necessarily there's going to be a change. You, you just want to vent your frustrations. But surely, given that it's a big club and a big player and it gets lots of publicity... It has a psychological effect so. on umpires yeah. as well. Yeah, mm. I agree with it that. It doesn't necessarily have to be an edict from the top. No, no. But uh, people look and uh, they don't want to be pinged for dud yeah, free kicks. Agree. What about the Cats, Mike? Uh, they have, uh, for uh, the first time mm. in a long history, started to give up some leads, as we've said. The past five years, the greatest lead they've given up is 21 points, and yet uh, their last uh, four lots, three rounds, I should say, 13, 15, and 17. They've led by big margins and uh, gone down in two of them. In two of them, yeah. Well, it, it's not a lack of resistance, but I remember watching the Brisbane game, you kept thinking, and like I did yeah. watching the Adelaide game, well, the Cats will pull this together and steady and kick a goal and they'll get through. Yeah. But they didn't. No, I mean, look, Scotty talked about it and he wasn't happy with their defensive stuff and we showed last week their numbers have certainly been a hell of a lot better. But... It is that they are an up-tempo team. They keep moving the ball, and, and with so many good ball users, generally they score. But when they're not scoring, they're still giving the chance of the opposition to stay in the game. It's very hard because they're such a talented team. They had two chances late, Rosie. Jimmy yep. Bartell with one, Harry Taylor with the other. Both tried the hook kick. Uh, correct strategy or not? Well, this is certainly something that's creeping into the game. This one probably, yeah, because I think, look at the angle that, that Jimmy's on. I mean, generally, he's a, he's, he's a beautiful kick anyway, so probably 50-50. I was really shocked with this one. I was really Harry's, shocked yep. with Harry. Look, he doesn't even... He, he's about three yards back off the mark, mm. and he's got four guys on the... I was very, very surprised with that one. It was different, though. Bartel looked like he had about eight metres. Yeah. And uh, uh, Harry looked like he had about yeah, three. three. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it also looked as if the Crows had learnt from the first one yeah. that uh, their defensive mechanism was much better. And, uh, I mean, it's been reintroduced. I'm not sure why they do it with a wet ball. Uh, well, they do do it. I mean, Johnson does I know it. They do it. Most does of the time it, yeah. it's with a dry ball. With a wet ball, I think you get less chance of it uh, curling the I way I just thought want. the Harry Taylor one was go back off the mark and he's, he's not on a horrendous angle, was he? Mm, no, I didn't think so. Not for a left footer. Not for a left uh, footer and uh, just uh, kick a drop punt. Yeah. What about uh, Tom Hawkins, Mike? You wanted to have a look at his shot at goal. It was uh, early in the match, four goals apiece. And Tom wheeled around instead of going back and uh, having a shot. Do you think he should go back and just well, make a certainty of it? I didn't. I don't have a problem. That's the way they play their yeah. footy. They share the ball. Mm. If he hits um, Motlop on the chest and he goes and pops it through, yeah. we just say that's the way they Great play. Great football. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, those things happen. I mean, Motlop himself missed one in the last. Could kick it out on the full. Yeah, yeah. Um, how does Scotty react to this now? Well, it becomes a little bit of a pattern. I mean, he's, he'd have enormous faith in his team, but I, I think. Okay, just some, some adjustments, just that ability to slow. And I know they're not, they don't like slowing the game down, but certainly two, two, twice against teams that aren't even going to play mm. in the eight. It's mm. not like we're talking about them doing it against Hawthorne or Sydney or Frio, one of the top four or five teams. It's happened against Brisbane and the Crows, who have been really struggling. We're talking about Rising Star. Mm. All the talk's been about Jaeger Amir, and I understand that. Mm. Ollie Wines. And, and Ollie Wines probably as the threat if there is one. Mm. It's a kid called Brad Crouch, plays for uh, Adelaide. Mm. He's had a good month. I haven't seen a lot of him, but I've seen him recently. He's a star, this kid. Yep. And his, his, his awareness and his decision-making uh, is outstanding. Well, I think you know when, when young players start to go in the middle of the ground, Mike, you know, and the centre bounces at critical times of games, you know that their coaches are starting to get some real faith in them. And you see here, you know, it certainly was in for a number. Yeah, great goal there. That's I mean, a that's clever just a goal. Really isn't it? clever yeah. kick of goal. Yeah. yeah, really smart. Should he have kicked that left foot, young bloke? Should he be equally adept on the other side? I don't mind. Side? I don't mind the guys side of the get foot. It. Yeah, I don't mind if you can get it. It was going to be a tough left footer as well. Sometimes that's a balancing. You know, you're going to throw it down really quickly. Mm. You could have the fresh area on the left, Mike. You probably would have done that a couple of times. Just, just very quickly, Scott Thompson was interchanged. Was that, uh, and subbed, was it injury? or was Scotty it... Thompson's body language suggested to me, Jerry, that he got yanked. He got... That Brendan Sanderson took him off the ground. And, look, I, I complimented Sando when he was in here at yeah. six or eight. He took Sam Jacobs off in one yeah. game, and they got through in that game too. I think if a bloke's not playing well, no matter what his, his name is, yeah. 
and he thinks that he's not going to get it for, back for the afternoon, take him off. Yeah, I think so. Maybe there's... We don't know with injuries as well. I think maybe there's... Because I would rather have Scotty Thompson on the ground, to be honest. Yeah. But we're not sure how healthy players are <clears> this time of year as well. I mean... You know, you get a fresh player on the ground, it's a, it's obviously a big bonus. Nick Rewald's about to join us. They take on Geelong on the weekend. Uh, they'll do so, Michael, without t James Bartell, who they was will, Jared. involved in a head-high collision. Yes, this rough conduct one. Now, it, it troubles me a bit, this. I understand what the motive is here. That's yep. to protect the bloke with his head over the footy. But Jimmy Bartell got two weeks for that, down to one with a guilty plea. Uh, have we overcorrected? Uh, i just got a fear that we're just actually, because of this protection of the head that any time there's any contact, regardless of the circumstances, we're going to come down heavy on it. Yeah, I must admit, I'm, we're tickly, this is a little bit different. That's Posey Adley on Douglas. The guy's standing up. But he's but up, I, yeah. yeah I, I, I think the guy with his head over the ball has to be protected, has to be looked after, whether that's one or two. I think the problem I think we're getting at the moment, Mike, is more the medical reports. The medical reports are certainly mm. have a significant bearing on how many weeks But there's a confluence of two issues here. There's the head over the ball, the paraplegia, yes. the quadriplegia, yep. and there is the latter-day concussion, concussion. Yep. problem that so, has really come to the fore. And I think that's why those types of incidents are getting one week at least. Well, it was the neck injury that, that led to this legislation. No, but it could have been. No, but it, that was what the, the concern was. Yeah. And I remember as soon as that legislation was brought in, Byron Pickett ran about 40 metres. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and we watch it here. And that was the time when we yeah. said, OK, this legislation is right and yeah. it's, protects, it'll go, it's going to eliminate yeah. that. Um, yeah, that was not, getting, uh, That wasn't good. That no. no that, but but they're not happening like that now. I just I just wonder whether we're so sensitive to this. And, now. and I think perhaps they're not happening because of the fact that yeah you know, they've been really hard. I, look, I think if you're a parent going to the game and you know young kids and mm. putting head over the ball, I mean I just. So, Bar I, so Bartel deserved two weeks, did he? Um, I think Bartel wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if he actually appeals yeah, that because yeah. I, I'm not sure he took him in the head. No. But the neck is considered part See, of the, the head in this you, rule. You blokes played not all that long ago. Your head over the footy, you, you, there was no protection for you. No, there it? wasn't. And I was a great uh, campaigner to get that protection because I worked in a spinal ward up in Sydney for four weeks. And to see players, or yeah. so, sorry, to see former athletes and normal people have their lives to completely yep. uh, disrupted through spinal injury just said to me, something has to change in this game because it is so lucky that we haven't had more injuries as mm. uh, a former Cats player is uh, just as sustained. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I, look, I know the rationale. Just. Anyway, look, I'm not sure. So what sure. would you do, though, just on that one? What would you do look, to, I think to minimize it? Look, I think it's clearly... It? The Byron Pickett one was clearly yeah, what okay. we're trying so to eliminate. Okay, so take that one out. Yeah. Talk to me about the concussion one. The concussion one... Well, well, the start of the year was one of the biggest issues nationally mm -hmm. in the yeah, game. Yeah, it was, but it wasn't all because of Black Hattie's head over the footy, though. No, that's not about the head over the footy. Yeah. I think everyone accepts that. But it's the, it's the shots to the head, even though they were minor-like pods. You don't know what minor is for various people. No, that's true. Yeah, well, we saw Dylan Robertson yeah, situation, no, exactly. which is yep. really scary. But mm. it's, a, gee, it's a moving feast, isn't it? If it's not a feast, but it's just moving. Yeah, it certainly is uh, becoming all too regular, but less so. And uh, still, we haven't had a bad spinal injury in the game for so many years. We're going to take a break. Nick Rewald is our guest. He joins us straight after this. Trail by 47 points at one stage in the second quarter, only to take the lead in the final term, but unfortunately didn't get the points. The captain of the Saints, Nick Rewald, joins us on the couch for about the 14th time. Welcome <laughs> to you, Nick. Thanks, Jared. How many more appearances have you got left in you? You had a controversial omission a couple of weeks ago, but it's great to have you back. Oh, it's good to be here. Certainly hope I've got at least one, one more maybe next year in me. But um, look, in, enjoying the role at the moment within the team and Certainly going through a transition with, with a lot of young players, but the senior players at the club are really enjoying the role we're playing within that. Nick, you are gearing up for the next phase of your life, clearly. Triple M 10 days ago, game day yesterday, couch tonight, AW next Sunday. Yeah, oh, that, that's definitely a, a focus for life post-football, but at the moment for me it's just about exploring some different options, 
uh, towards the end of my career. So, so when my career eventually finishes, and whether that's you know, at the end of, of next year or you, know, you, you never count your chickens at, at this stage as a 30-year-old, so I want to be well prepared when I finish f football to be able to make considered decisions rather than rush decisions. Before the break, we were talking about uh, the, the direction the game has gone you know, in protecting the head, in particular the two weeks for Jimmy Bartell. What's your thoughts on it? Well, I think it's a good rule in principle because it protects the players' well-beings and, and, and that's, that's at the utmost and um, forefront of everyone's concerns, I think, to protect players and make sure that they've got great longevity both in the game and, and healthy lives post the game. And I think you know, what we're seeing in the NFL at the moment with, with what's happening overseas with about 4,000 players are suing the NFL uh, in, in America, mm. you know, a class action because of long-term um, con conditions relating to concussion episodes throughout their playing careers. So, look, I, I think it's a good rule. Um, it's, it's just how it's policed, but I think in principle it's a good rule. Do, do you feel the game's safer now? I mean, you've started, you've been playing, what, 12 years or whatever it is. Do you feel, we talked about, you know, relating to what Mike was talking about before, it seems pretty safe going out in the ground now, not too many worries as a player, put your head over the ball, those sort of things? Yeah, I, I, and I think that's great, and I think that's, that's a real positive for our game, and that makes it exciting um, to watch and... and and I think for, for parents that want to encourage their kids to be able to play our sport, that's really important for the growth of our game. But certainly as a player, to go out and know that you know, there's, there's none of the sniping that used to go on and, and you can put your head over the ball um, you know, and go into contests to contest with a, a great level of assurance that you know, you're not going to cop a really significant injury. Obviously they still happen from time to time and that's just a part of the game but I think it's for the good of the game. And just with the changes, interesting, I mean probably the two or three years ago we had a lot of zones. I think we showed some stuff here about you sort of running from a man into a man. It seems in the last sort of 18 months, particularly this year, it's gone back to more that one-on-one -on -one contest where you're able to take your man on. Is that a fair assessment of, of where you seem the game swinging back again? Yeah, I think it has. I think a couple of years ago, the team defence right across the competition was, was so good that it, it really became very difficult for any teams to score. But footy's amazing in that it, it finds a way to balance itself out and it's sort of like Mother Nature in a way. It just, it just finds a way to find that equilibrium. And I think the game's in a really good, really good place at the moment. Um, you know, teams are scoring heavily. It's an exciting brand of football. And, and you know, coaches and players, they find a way to overcome different things. But do you find you're back onto that? It looks more now like it's now Nick Rewall versus the centre-half back again. Yeah, you know, This year and maybe back into last year. Instead as opposed of three to, blokes being down Instead there. of three blokes, <laughs> you know, you'd, you'd lead and then Mike would be standing there and you'd lead into Jared. It just seems and Cozzy being uh, down the back there as well. <laughs> yeah. That, Jumping that, on that still head. happens, mm -hmm. um, depending on which teams <laughs> you play. The very good defensive teams are still really good at the handing over and, and zoning and flooding an area. So that still occurs, but I think you're right. I think there has been a shift back towards a more traditional type of role for a, for a forward line player. Nick, so agonisingly close to two flags, now you find yourself 16th with three wins. How difficult are you finding it to get up every week with the same enthusiasm that we've always associated with your game? Well, it's different. There's different motivations. And you, you say three wins, but I don't think we're a three-win team, the way we've played. No, but that's the reality. It is the reality, yeah. and that's where we sit on the ladder. But I'm taking a great level of satisfaction personally from, from being able to play a role with the young guys and, and aid in the transition of them coming through and, and that's what you need to do as a senior player. You need to you know, find different motivations so certainly there's a, a pride aspect in your own performance and there's a responsibility as well. I was a young player once and I had great leadership from you know, your guys like Aaron Hamill and Robert Harvey and Fraser Gehrig and Stewie Lowe so the wheel turns and, and now it's my opportunity to play that sort of role and, and that's what motivates me. Well, what is the missing ingredients because you, you are a three win team but you, you're right you don't seem like a three win team we probably don't put you in the basket of the Melbournes and that but the reality is you've only won three games what, what do you think the missing ingredient has been to, to not being able to win more than three? We've been really competitive but we've had some really poor quarters along the way uh, and I, I think a lot of that comes down to, to experience um, you know we've, we've got a a lot of young guys. I think on the weekend we had 10 players that had played less than 20 games and, and that's a lot and clearly teams like Geelong have been able to handle that but we haven't been able to handle that as well but I, I think you know, we're, we're slowly seeing some improvement from, from some young players and um, I think the future is bright for the football club. Let's take a look at the profile uh, of your club because there's going to be some big decisions under Scott Waters. Uh, if you have a look at the age You've got uh, plenty of young kids, as you said, coming through in the 18 to 22 age group and uh, you're getting some significant improvements out of those young guys. 
Then uh, I guess the, the story really is the 29 pluses. You've got 11 players there, 28% of your list, and the average of the AFL is 14. So somebody's going to have to make some hard decisions, and I suspect a few of them are going to have to be made at the end of the year. Yeah, well, I think that's you know, on everyone's radar, and, and everyone would be well aware of that. Some of them are going to be forced decisions, yep. and some of them are going to be voluntary decisions. So that's the nature of football clubs at the end of every year. You know, people, people come and people go and you know, it's a bit of a, a revolving door but they're decisions that um, the, the club administration and, and coaches will, will make at the end of the year in con consultation with, with the players. But Lenny will get to make his own choice for argument's sake. Do you think he'll play next year? Oh, it's, it's a really tough one. Um, I certainly hope so. Uh, purely from a, a selfish point of view, I, I think he's still got a lot to offer in terms of his role within the team as, as just a player. Um, but the character of the person, to have him around a football club, is, is, is just invaluable. So I hope he goes how on. Does Nick, how does Nick deal with the fact that he's the constant name thrown up as the tradable bait, if you like? Nick Del Santo. Nick Del Santo. Um, it's, it's not really discussed at all. And I, I think it's perhaps thrown up a lot externally, but I'm not too sure whether you know, Del would even be aware of that, to be honest. Um, you know, stuff like that doesn't really tend to permeate through to club land too much. One of the other senior blokes, Stephen Milne, uh, yeah, teammate of yours, we know that, and we know why he's been in the news of recent times. Has that been particularly difficult for the playing group? Look, I think any time it's spoken about, there's the real potential for it to cause distress to everyone involved. Um, so for, for that reason, I don't, I don't want to get into the details of, of you know, how different people have reacted, but come the end of the year, you know, I think based solely on Milne's football, there'll, there'll be a decision okay. made. And One, off on a slight tangent, when he played, when he came back for the Carlton game, were you distressed uh, about the, the stuff that was coming over the fence? No, didn't even notice it, to be honest, Mike. Um, read a bit of stuff in the paper post-game, but during the game, didn't, didn't notice it. Big, big change of coach a couple of years ago. What are the main differences between Scott and, and Ross as, as a coach, person, personalities, game plans, etc.? Yeah, look, any time a new coach comes in, I think there's an adjustment phase. And um, I went through that with Grant Thomas into Ross Lyon. I was going to say Malcolm Blight into <laughs> Grant Thomas, but I only had Blight as a coach for my uh, first game, and that was, that was his last. But, um, yeah, look, clearly um, both, both great leaders. Um, Ross has been able to go to Fremantle and, and do a wonderful job over there, and I think they're you know, a great opportunity for the, for the flag this year. But Scott's come in, and it's a, it's a totally different situation to when um, Ross was coach. We've got a lot of young players and um, going through a transition, but I think the job that he's done so far with, you know, with both the senior players, the way he's embraced, embraced us and what we've achieved in the past, and at the same time brought on the, um, the, the young guys has been really admirable. Can you tell us about the spinning treatment that you're getting for your knee and how the knee's going? Yeah, I've had another course of that this year. Um, I think sort of round six through to about round 12 is a six-week treatment. So what the happens? Orth orthokine treatment. So basically they, they um, take out some of your blood and, and spin it down and take all the anti-inflammatory properties out yep. of the blood. I get this done at... Olympic Park, a, a guy called Paul Marks down there, and it's called the orthokine therapy. And uh, then over a six-week course, they inject that back into your knee. So it's, it's all natural stuff from your body. Mm -hmm. They just take out the good parts of it, and, and it's therefore more concentrated and, yep. and put it back in. And the idea is that it just improves the atmosphere and the environment within the knee and, and reduces a bit of swelling, because that's my big problem, trying to get the swelling down. Mm -hmm. So Will it I'd be the knee that determines the end of your career, do you think? Or it, do you think it will be, yeah. yeah. If, if I'm honest, that, that's going to be the thing that eventually stops me playing because everything else feels really good. I touch wood, don't have too many problems with soft tissue injuries. It's just the knee week to week and, and managing that. Nick, we've always admired the way you've lived with the regular poor delivery that you've had over your career. Yet this year there have been signs that you've, it's frustrated you. I mean, we've seen you with your arms out and you can just tell that it's sort of, I don't know whether it's the, the accumulate, the aggregate toll or whether it's just the way the delivery's been this year. Yeah, no doubt I've had a, a couple games and a few instances within games where my body language has, has got the better of me, but that's something that I you know, need to be aware of and as a leader of a football club I need to keep my emotions in check and um, you know, I'll endeavour to keep doing that. Just a quick one before you go. We hear lots of stories about you blokes being discontent having to go to Seaford every day. Is the, oh. is the player group, is that, a, is that a real issue or not? Or just a Probably more so for the senior players. Um, the young guys don't know any better, but you know, I live just down the road here, so it's a, it's a bit of a trek down to Seaford on, on the freeway, but plenty of people have to travel 
for their jobs. It's um, very I've diplomatic. Be I've said before that there's not a not a you know a lot of variety and, and choice down there if you want to go to a cafe or something. And coffee I had truck a, pulls up, doesn't it? I had a yeah, the coffee truck pulls up, and I had a lady write a letter um, after I said that the last time and said, you know, there's a McDonald's down the road, there's a charcoal chicken, there's you know, there's plenty of options. So that was nice. Sure, I appreciate, appreciated the uh, feedback. Well, if you join the media as uh, perhaps you're going to, you can go to Darwin uh, any time you like, or <laughs> Brisbane, or whatever. You'll be travelling. For your work, do you know what uh, round 18, 2004 means to you? Round 18, 2004. That was the last no. time you played at uh, Simmons Stadium. I uh, hope you don't right? get lost in the way down there. That's all right. No, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll carpool down and we'll um, looking forward to it. It should be a great atmosphere down there. I think it's great for the city of Geelong. Yep. They've got the lights mm. in and look forward to the weekend. Great to have you on board again, Nick. Good luck for the rest of Thanks, uh, your year and your career and uh, we'll speak to you again, no doubt, Appreciate in the near future. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Nick Rewild, the guest, the captain of the Saints. They take on Geelong. We've got a little bit more to go straight after this on the couch. Down for Judd. Couldn't get onto it. Judd, so quiet tonight. He's been under enormous pressure, and I, and I thought he played OK. I reckon we won that game without any mids really winning their position. So, so we're doing something right around the ground. Carlton surging, Judd, well this would be something, well it's not something, he's just had a forgettable night at the champ, he really has. You know, Juddy, as he said, he called it a stinker, I, I reckon uh, it wasn't, it was close to. I haven't seen Juddy so subdued ever, I really haven't. The Blues got across the line, but a lot of the discussion was about Chris Judd. The beauty for us all is that it's Judd v Ablett on the weekend, mm. Michael, and uh, that's something to salivate That is, there's no doubt about that, and he'll be pumped for this. We don't see it on the ground, but he'll be really uh, pumped up for this. But they play to their own standards, blokes like yeah. Judd and Ablett, don't they? Oh, absolutely. You look, he just looked tired on the weekend, I guess, and, that, and maybe that's the run home, you know, give him that weekend off. I mean, obviously... They certainly haven't clinched the finals berth by any stretch of the imagination. But to me, he just looked tired. I mean, he's, he's obviously carried you know, Carlton for many, many years. I wouldn't say he carried West Coast. He had a lot of help at West mm. Coast. But he had a lot of injuries too, Mike, hasn't he? I mean, he had the osteitis and he did. had the shoulders taped up since he first arrived. But he's arrived. had that all year. Unless there's been an, a fresh injury, yeah. this is just a, a stinker, if uh, to use his own term. Do you think it's the cumulative effect, do you? I, look, I think it's possible. I, look, I, I think we all give Juddie the benefit of the doubt. I don't think he's going to have another stinker this week. See, so in terms of age and games played, he and Ablett are the same. But Gary Ablett looks like he's going to play for another five to six years. He does. They've had very different uh, yeah. starts to Gazza their career. had his first four years parked as a forward. And half yeah. forward, yeah. 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 I mean, Juddy's been in the heat of the battle, inside stoppage midfielder for, you know, for 12 odd years or whatever it is. So, yeah, you would think that yeah, his body would be a bit more battered than... And we don't know what injuries they've carried during their, their time. I mean, that osteitis he had at the end of the West Coast was pretty debilitating yeah. from him, for him as well. He really struggled with that. So, But as I said, I don't expect him to have, an, you know, in his own words, another stinker. The other bloke that was uh, stuffed or tied, uh, to use his <laughs> own terminology, is Todd Goldstein. And we saw again on the weekend, I think everybody was actually uh, surprised at some of the uh, rotation numbers you put up last week, but in the last quarter it really did tell. Hey, look, he ha I, I feel sorry for him because of the workload he's carrying, yeah. but he had to get to that contest. Well, I think that's he the just point, though. If you look at the first, first, fourth quarter there, Mike, six disposals yep. to zero, marks three to zero, yeah, hit outs, match minutes. I think that the point we tried to make last week is, and he even sort of said, and we might hear about it in a minute, but uh, I think the point is, I don't think he can get to it. You know, and it was interesting that, that I watched the game closely again. He was spending a lot of time as that sort of floating Ruckman mm. half back, but he was yep. also chasing the centre half forward a lot. <laughs> there was one time where he's chased Henderson into, into the goal square, Henderson kicked a, a goal. So he does a lot of work that probably yep. people don't see. And by the end of the game, he's just exhausted. But so we talked last week about their setup and going with the one Ruckman, and there's, there's Dorr and Curry at, at, at North, aren't they? Yeah, I'm not sure what Curry's position. He had the broken you were, thumb. You I think. Well, I, I love him. He was on. injured with the broken yeah, so, thumb. So, does he? Does Brad Scott now have to say we need to nurse this bloke? Because Drew Petrie was a was an alternative, but Drew Petrie was so good forward in the last quarter, yeah. would have been silly to take him up the and ground. not getting rested himself yeah. with the rotations. It looks to me as if uh, Brad's going to have to try to, and do something different because. Uh, the losses are mounting up. What well, seems to? I mean, it, it seems to. You, you've got to change something at some point. You know, I, I think it was a it was a different loss because they actually came back on the weekend. So it wasn't a loss where they faded. Can one individual act, Ruzi, change the future of a man at a football club? Because Chris Yaron appears to be the guy that everybody thinks is going to be put up for trade. 
He was a high draft pick and we know he's an exceptional talent. And this was an incredibly courageous mark in the forward line. We know he can play half back, uh, perhaps a little bit loose at this stage. Look, but he's, he's too good a player, in my view, to give away. He wouldn't have wanted to have done that. I give Mick credit for this. Yep. I thought Mick was hard on him a month ago. Yep. But I think what we saw on Friday night vindicated that, that hardness. Well, you know that what Darren I... now knows he hasn't got a choice. You've got to go. Talking about a stinker. He had a stinker first half. Yeah, you yeah. know what I liked? I love the way he worked his way into the yeah. game with tackling and work rate. And that's probably something that he wasn't known for. And then all of a sudden he goes back and takes that mark. I think it could be the turning point for him. I think the problem is at Carlton, they've got Betts, Gartlett, Yaron. Yeah. You can't play them all. Okay. Why can't so you play Yaron back? Give him the tough love and put him back. I, yeah. I'm saying you can't play yeah. him as forwards. But Mick, I mean, Mick's taken him out of that defensive role. I yeah. think it's just an adjustment for Mick to say, OK, well, I, I know I can't play three you know, small forwards forward. We've I don't mind it because that releases a, a Simpson or a Walker into your midfield where they do need a little bit more pace through that midfield as well. You're talking about one moment that can change yeah. a career. I'll give you one moment that almost changed the game on Friday night. Daniel Wells embarrassed himself. Yeah, it wasn't good. When he watched... And there was a Zach Tui run past him. Yep. Yeah. Now, there he is there. And, and who's chasing Zach Tui? And, and, there's, <laughs> and Goldstein's chasing him. Yep. Wells, he knew what he'd done wrong there, didn't he? Yeah. And I think because... He's the player, he's a, and, and because he wants to be part of this team, his next 15 minutes were outstanding, was he? And I yeah, they were. And here he was is. trying to purge himself. Armfield was on him there, and yep. he ran through. You're right. I think I think he would have been embarrassed. I think that's a fair word. I mean, we we, we occasionally highlight the guy that ducks his head or whatever. Yeah, we and, and we've all done it. We all haven't chased. But the problem with football today, not the problem. The good thing for cameras. us is the cameras. Yeah. I mean, you can't get away with yeah. those things in football. You've just got to be thinking all the time. You've got to be working all the time. It's never been more demanding to be an AFL footballer. Port Lions, both winners on the weekend, and they uh, up against each other. It's an important game. Both have got uh, chances to make the eight. Port have currently inside the eight. Westhoff comes back, yeah. and it looked like he was purging himself as well, Michael. Yeah, Jared, he started the season really well. He and did. Then had a flat spot, but it's been an intriguing career from this bloke. Yeah, it has. Early on, 2007, his yeah. first year, played in the grand final, looked like he was going to be a star. I reckon he had three or four years where he went nowhere. Yeah, he just sort of lost his way, didn't he, yeah. Mike? He, he wasn't a forward. That's or, good pace, yeah, that's isn't really it? that's really good, really good. It wasn't, he didn't seem to be a forward, a centre, back, a ruckman. I love that. That's yeah. what I love, going back. He took two really telling marks. There's 2.15 to go in the last quarter yeah, with the Saints coming. This is a really, really good contested yep. mark for a guy. Just eyes on the footy. That's the sort of stuff that, that you like to see. Before we go to the break, uh, a new uh, concept in football. What's your decision? Yep. Some really interesting commentary with uh, Tony Shaw and Dermot Brereton and up in Darwin. Have a look. And Reigns is running for him. Zorko with the bounce. He'll say Shepard. Reigns for Shepard. No doubt. And the magician said, I've got the bag of tricks. You Shepard for me. I'll kick the goal. Abracadabra. <laughs> he said, no, no, mate. You come and do this part. You're a defender. You're a tagger. And I'm the one who kicks the goal. But that, that is the way it should have happened too. But because mate, he's not he's shot. Dane Zorko. <laughs> you can't call out a bloke like that. So the bottom line was Dane Zorko gets and he drags Reigns over. He says, come yeah. on, mate. I'm I like not handballing it. to you. I I'm... like it. Young blokes with confidence. That's right. Rusey, should a coach, uh, as a coach, who do you agree with? I think that Zorko's there to kick goals. Mm. I think Zorko's role is that up up and back forward. We saw last week we kicked the goal uh, on, on Swallow. We mentioned it here. I don't mind that. You know, I mean, six of one half does the other because I'm not suggesting that Reigns is just there to, to tag. But I don't mind that. You've got the confidence. You're a forward. He's a goal kicker. He's a goal kicker. Yep. Yep. He's got nice skills. I don't mind it. The, the, what you've got to do is finish. That's yep. as simple as that. And he's, and he's finished. He did certainly he went, finish. For, for his sake. <laughs> he's lucky he didn't miss that. Ooh, yeah. Damn it, would have got him. You live by the sword, you die by the <laughs> sword. Right. Time for a break. A little bit more on the other side. I, I should have gone straight away. Um, but what, do mean, was, what do you mean by that? I should have left straight away. Left Carlton? Yeah. Even though I won the bet, but you know what? What, because of your relationship with Dennis? Yeah, look, it just wasn't, look, I, I, I have the greatest respect for Dennis and, and everything like that, but just from a working relationship, we didn't, we didn't get the best out of one another. Have a look at that, Corey. That's Dennis talking to you at Carlton. Yeah. What do you read in his expression there? You've seen that plenty of times. Um, yeah, the picture probably tells a thousand words. Mm. <laughs> Corey McKernan with a great story. 
with Open Mike straight after this. Buddy Franklin on at 8.30 tomorrow, and he's going to be in the house, Mike, uh, taking your tweets. <laughs> It's going to be waiting a while, Jared. <laughs> We're going to uh, be exposed, or showing each and every one of his uh, 13 goals from Tasmania last year. Uh, Hutto was actually demanded that it goes on, and he'll be the one tweeting. But you can tweet hashtag at uh, Buddy Franklin. So get involved there. The good news I thought over the weekend from Kevin Sheedy, and it was a bit of a mixed message, but she has basically said that uh, he would prefer that the number one pick stays with the GWS, so they get Tom Boyd, which to me makes a lot of sense. Well, it does, but it won't be Kevin's call, will it? I mean, Leon Cameron's no. the coach, is it? I, I, the, the I coach... think what Kevin Sheehan's saying is you, you're probably not going to get like for like, but what I think it should be on the table. I don't mind the idea of throwing it up for two or three players. Don't expect to get like for like, but you might be able to package up a Ruckman, a centre-half back and a decent midfielder and give someone the number one draft pick. Three players for one player, I think, is perhaps something that they need to look at. Just before we go, Rizzi, I want to know what this message sends. Yep. This is a, um, a GWS Essendon incident at the weekend, right? There's Heppel and, and, uh, and Wiley going out. Wiley goes to ground. The essence of the game now is just keep your feet. He gets the free kick because of incidental contact. How does that happen? Well, there's the sliding rule. I mean, it's, you know, Self-inflicted head high, Mike. Yep. No free kick. No free kick. Play no free on. Kick. Mm. Correct. That's Good hashtag, decision. hashtag Buddy13. <laughs> Buddy's in the house tomorrow night at 8.30. We're out of the house, but uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks for joining us. On the couch. Nice shirt, Rudy. Yours isn't bad either.